Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Beneath the Surface, where we focus on social, Islamic and political issues. Joining us today on the show is Dr. Stephen Sizer, who is an author of two books on Christian Zionism. We'll be reviewing his second book, Zionist Christian Soldiers, and focusing on the third chapter, The Promised Land, From the Nile to Euphrates. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. Pleasure. Um, let's start off with who is the Holy Land um, promised to, and what exactly is the Holy Land? Well, the promise goes back to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham um, because Abraham trusted in God. He said, I will make you the father of many nations. And he said, I give you this land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. And we're not quite sure what the river of Egypt is. It could be the Nile. It could be a tributary, probably, um, you know, the Nile Delta, one of those tributaries up to the Euphrates, which means much of the Middle East, if we look at the Fertile Crescent from the Euphrates down to Egypt. Essentially, God was promising that land to the descendants of Abraham. Now, the, uh, the Zionists reading back into Scripture believe that God gave them that land uh, exclusively and not uh, the Arabs, not the other races who live there. And that's the conflict, that's the reason for the tension. If we go back to the promises, um, we can say that the promises were partially fulfilled in the time of Joshua. Uh, in Joshua, God says, and so the promises were fulfilled. Well, we know that Joshua didn't take all of that land, but it was regarded as having been fulfilled. So either Joshua was not using the same maps uh, or he didn't take the, the, the promise that literally. When we come to the time of King David and Solomon, there are references in the books that tell the story of, uh, of kings uh, that David, um, his empire extended to the Euphrates. So it could be argued that the promises were fulfilled in ancient history and therefore don't await future fulfillment. But residence in the land was always conditional on faithful obedience of God's law. Even before God's people had entered into the promised land, um, and they were made up of many nationalities, by the way, it wasn't racially pure. They weren't all the children of, um, of Isaac, for example. The promises were conditional. And, and Moses, for example, uh, God spoke through Moses warning that when you go into the land, don't be arrogant. Don't think that you've, uh, you've won the land through conflict or through your, uh, your goodness or your arrogance or your power. Uh, the land belongs to me, says God, and you are tenants, aliens, you are the tenants. So at best, God's people were only ever the residents. In, in English terms, we talk about freehold and leasehold. Freehold means the land is yours. Leasehold means that you're a tenant. You pay rent to the owner. So God says the land is mine and you are the tenants. So the land was only ever given temporarily. And again, under Moses, he warned, choose this day which way you're going to go. Uh, obey me and you will have a long life in the land. Disobey me and the land will vomit you out. That's the word that God actually uses. It's, it's to be sick. It will throw you out. And we know in history, uh, before the, the coming of Jesus or Muhammad, that God's people were thrown out of the land uh, under, uh, under the uh, empire of Babylon and under the empire of Assyria, for example. And then they were occupied by the Greeks, by, uh, by the Romans uh, and by the Muslims. You know, the land was occupied, was controlled by other empires and by other uh, faith groups. So God's word came true. It was always conditional. It was always uh, temporary. And then we can add a th another dimension under the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, for example, who were writing when God's people were out of the land in Babylon, looking forward, hoping that they could come back. Um, God said, I am going to let you back because you've repented, you are sorry, under Ezra and Nehemiah. But when you get back to the land, you'll find there are people living there. They are my people. 
and you must share the land, share the inheritance with the foreigners. So they were allowed back into the land, God's people, but they were to share the land with others of God's people who had been resident in the land. The Babylonians didn't take everyone uh, to Babylon. They left the, the farmers, the poorer people, to work the land so they could benefit from the, the food and the produce. The problem was, when the Jews came back, they wanted the land for themselves, and it set up the tensions that we see in the Christian scriptures and subsequently in, in Muslim history. So if we were to take all of that uh, biblical teaching and apply it to today, I think we could say confidently that God wants people to share the land, his land, it's not my land, it's not the, the Zionist land, it belongs to God. We, we, we enjoy its blessings, the fruit, the, the produce, and the security that it brings us, but it's not ours. So the Zionists have got to share the land. That either means two states, Palestine and Israel, or one state, Israel, Palestine, to be shared by all its peoples. You're saying the whole um, two state, one state, but isn't that just something that politicians tend to just tell us so we can just be hopeful and just, you know, wish for either one, knowing that it's not actually going to happen. Yes, I think so too. I think that the two-state solution is dead because of the settlements, because of the illegal uh, destruction of Palestinian homes. It's clear the Zionists want to create a land with no people. The problem is there are people on the land, so they're getting rid of them. Um, but I, I, as an as a Englishman, I wouldn't presume to tell the, uh, the, the Palestinians what they should do. Some want their own separate state, others want uh, the land back that was stolen from them in 1948. So that's got, there's got to be a compromise somewhere along the line among the people who live there, rightly or wrongly, whether they be uh, Jewish or uh, Muslim or Christian. Somehow we've got to find a way of sharing the land in the Middle East. So as with Europe, you know, Europe uh, was made up of nation states that were at war with each other for hundreds of years. But since the forming of the economic community, the European community, we've had a measure of stability. We have individual sovereignty, but we have um, common uh, trade and common laws that uh, each individual country has agreed to, to respect the European uh, declarations on human rights, for example, and so on. So I think it's quite feasible in the Middle East for nation states to coexist, cooperate, have a federation, uh, as much as, uh, uh, honestly, I believe the only way forward is for the end of Zionism and a, a, a nation state that is uh, where equal rights are respected for Arabs and Jews. We would love the whole um, idea of equal rights, but how true is that? How, like how being do we an get there? Yeah, how, not just how do we get there, but is it something that actually can you know, happen? Because when saying it, it's so much easier than actually it's happening mm. you know, in Palestine, for example. It takes time, it takes time, and we are impatient. Uh, and um, the dilemma we face is we have to look back in history and see uh, for hundreds of years we tolerated slavery. Uh, we treated, in, in Europe and in Britain, we treated uh, black people as inferior, that they could be used like goods, um, slaves and so on. Europe came to recognize that that was both uh, inconsistent with our faith, but also um, in, in unacceptable. Now, that doesn't mean that blacks and whites are treated equally necessarily, uh, but we are a long way away from slavery. So there's progress. The same in South Africa. Uh, there are still tensions between blacks and whites in South Africa, uh, even though apartheid has been um, uh, uh, removed from the, from the laws for 20, 30 years. So it takes time. And my hope is that as we educate the children, Israeli, Palestinian children, they might, we might get to the point where they can actually make friends with each other, go to the same schools together, um, 
as, as Christians and Muslims have done so in Palestine before the rise of Zionism. Uh, but clearly the extremists, those who want an exclusive claim to the land and denigrate uh, those of other faiths, in particular the Zionists, really there is no future as long as they have power and as long as they have the, the influence that they have. So, you know, what's the alternative? We either work for peace and, uh, and have a prophetic role and focus on uh, using boycotts, divestment sanctions, uh, getting the United Nations uh, to, to condemn Zionism and condemn uh, the apartheid regime, or we put our energy into another war. But we know that, you know, a as we see in Syria help. and Iraq, it doesn't, it takes, it's just like opening a wound and it takes longer to heal. Of course, and the thing is, when we are to look at the situation in Palestine, um, in this day and age, there are more Israeli citizens that are actually, you know, protesting for Palestine. And even in um, the UK, for example, there are many Jewish organizations mm. who are supporting the Palestinians. However, the way they are treated by the Israeli government afterwards, mm. like they're always attacked by the soldiers, they're either um, imprisoned or silenced, or, and at the same time, the media doesn't really cover them. You would just find a few... Um, mm like organizations or companies that would actually cover mm. what the Israeli uh, you know, youth are actually doing. Mm. And the problem is that that you know, understanding between the Israeli and the, Jew and the Arabs, um, be it Christian or Muslim in Palestine, they do have that type of understanding, not as much as we would hope for, mm. but they still have that understanding. But the big problem we have is the Zionist state because mm. they're just silencing the, these people. They are. And but I am hopeful that we are seeing a change, certainly in the West, um, in the media. It's slow, it's partial, it's inconsistent, but we are making progress with boycotts, divestment sanctions. Um, the Swedish government, the Spanish, uh, the British parliament, uh, Eastern European parliament, some of them have uh, voted in favor of recognizing the state of Palestine. There's a momentum. If we can get um, the International Court of Justice to recognize the Palestinian uh, right to bring cases against Israeli politicians and military personnel for war crimes, that will continue to put pressure on Israel to uh, back away from its, its uh, racist agenda in Palestine. When looking back at the Holy Land, do, does the Zionist state believe that they're meant to um, have more than one state, meaning Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria and Jordan, because, you know, they believe that's what was promised to Abraham? Well, there are some within the Zionist movement who do take a maximalist approach, would quote the promises God made to Abraham, and that would be their ambition. But uh, very few would, um, would um, expect to see that realized in their lifetime. Um, I mean the, what we have to look at is what their agenda has been in relation to their neighbors. And clearly, uh, the Zionists would like to destabilize uh, strong government in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt, and so on and have, ha have had a measure of success there, um, or has tried to neutralize its neighbors, as in the case of Jordan and Egypt, through, um, through uh, US involvement, um, you know, the integration of its military personnel, its intelligence services, or through financial inducements to convince leaders to to kind of bend with the Pax Americana, if you like. Uh, so we can clearly see the Zionist agenda is to weaken or destabilize or promote conflict between its enemies, um, if not to colonize their land, at least to weaken those it sees as a threat. Um, so I've no, I've no, uh, I'm not naive when it comes to what I think the Zionists are capable of doing. Again, as we've seen with ISIS in Iraq and Syria, they've been able to take relatively large amounts of land very quickly uh, 
through use of terror and with relatively few uh, soldiers or, or, or you know fighters on the ground. So um, yes, I would want to see stable government in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and so on in order to again put pressure on Israel to give up the Golan Heights and uh, and and um, see its future as one that will only be secure when it respects the rights of all its citizens. Do you think what's actually taking place in um, Iraq, Syria and kind of Lebanon, because Lebanon is kind of involved mm. in supporting the Syrians um, against ISIS and also like Egypt, the situation there isn't actually stable. Mm. Do you think the Zionists are actually behind this, um, you know, trying to create, not just create the conflict, but you know, they're supporting ISIS and other regimes mm. that are um, destabilizing well, the states. Well, there was an article in the papers this week. Uh, uh, Israeli Druze have been protesting that the Israel is giving medical services to wounded uh, Syrian insurgents who are linked to the opposition, linked to ISIS. So clearly there is some relationship between Israel and the opposition in Syria. Um, Clearly, going back 20, 30 years, the US has had an agenda for the Middle East that um, w has desired to redraw many of the borders within uh, the Middle East to, in their words, to uh, bring greater stability. But in doing so, um, you know, it can only lead to more conflict and tension. I think that they would like to see Iraq partitioned um, and probably Syria too. They clearly have an agenda to remove the, uh, the Assad regime in Syria um, and, and put in a compliant leadership that will work much more closely with Israel and the United States. Clearly Israel wants to hang on to the Golan and I understand some of the opposition groups have said that if Israel supports them they will accept that. So yes, I think there is a link. How far Israel is being proactive in fomenting tension, I don't know. That's, it, it's really surprising that um, they want to partition the countries because it's only going to be creating more conflict and more mm. war, which of course the US and Israel itself would actually like because in that way they'll be selling more weapons, they'll be able to you know, gain more um, you know, profit because you know, when they sell their weapons their economy actually grows. Mm. So in that sense they're they are kind of behind it, in a way. They're benefiting, certainly. Yeah, but then when we're to look at um, Abraham's uh, God's promise to Abraham, Abraham is regarded as a prophet mm. for the three re religions, and that's why they're called the Abrahamic faiths, meaning mm. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Mm. So the fact that these three religions actually live in these countries, like. Um, uh, Iraq is known to be a more uh, Muslim country, mm -hmm. as is Syria. Lebanon is kind of in between Christians and Muslims. But why is Israel determined that it's you know, promised only for the Jews? Well, Zionism has, in a sense, stolen the Bible. It's used the Bible to give itself a measure of uh, legitimacy as a political uh, concept. And certainly, you know, there are, what, 12 million Jews in the world. It's a small community if you add them all up. Half live in Israel, Palestine, and half live elsewhere. Um, certainly in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, Israel actively um, encouraged Christians to buy into a view of the world driven by what they said the Bible teaches. So many of the strongest advocates for uh, you know, the, 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 the growth of Zionism and the realization of those promises God made to Abraham is coming from Christian Zionists. So I believe that the Zionists realize that Christians accept the Hebrew scriptures and, uh, and therefore have tried to use the Bible to justify Zionism. And that's why the books I've written have tried to deconstruct that abuse of the Bible, uh, but they've used the Bible in, in many ways. <clears throat> For example, naming Israeli settlements after biblical place names that no longer exist. Mm. 
Uh, so they've ignored the, the uh, Arabic and the Christian names of these towns and reinvested them with a sense of, uh, you know, their biblical roots. But as we know, the Jews uh, were only one of the people groups who were descended from Abraham uh, who were living in the land. So that's why we come back to the conviction that the land must be shared. Of course, and when we look back through history, and the fact that you mentioned that, um, you know, there were certain prophets that were actually, you know, they were vomited out of the state because the state was meant to be shared and, mm. you know, God's land should be shared. You know, there's no, we can't really argue that. But didn't they actually learn from the history? Well, people tend to have a very, sh- very segmented or short, short-term memory when it comes to history. You look at the, uh, you know, the First World War, tens of millions were killed and you would have thought you know, political leaders would have said, we, we must never do this again. And yet within 30 years, we had another world war. We've had a cold war since then. We've had the wars with, in China, in, in Vietnam, uh, the cold war with Russia. Um, so, so we should learn from history, but unfortunately, um, you know, within our hearts, collectively and individually, there is, um, tension between the desire to obey God and at the same time to rebel against him because of the temptation uh, to find our security in wealth, in property, in land and so on. So yes, the Zionists should have learnt the legacy of um, the Holocaust, for example, the great suffering and recognise that their security would, would rest in in, in helping to form a better world where war would be repudiated rather than creating a, a racist state that is perpetuating those conflicts. Of course, and, and, but that's the thing that we see today. Like the Zionists, they're just creating more war and more conflict instead of you know, following the, the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, mm. which is you know, to be peaceful and, and to be treating your neighbor you know, just as well as you would want to be treated. Mm. But then when looking at the security of the Zionists, yes, they have their own land. Yes, you know, the people living in Israel are secure in the sense that they're not, they shouldn't be attacked by Palestine. And if they were, what the Palestinians have is nothing in comparison Mm. to the Israelis. But are they not afraid that, you know, one day, like what they're doing in um, Jerusalem today for Al-Aqsa, that they're going to actually be attacked by, you know, the... The Muslim followers? Yes. The, the, I mean, the reality is, as we know in, in, in Britain and in other countries, that uh, the rule of law, uh, where citizens are treated equally, irrespective of their religion or race, is essential for social harmony, where one group is marginalised or discriminated against or more likely to end up in prison, for example, that creates tensions. And... Um, I think that the tragic events we've seen in recent weeks in Jerusalem demonstrate that no one is safe, even with eight metre high walls, even with security guards and, uh, you know, uh, an army that is on a a continue, you know, where every adult, uh, male and female, is conscripted into the army. It doesn't lead to peace and security. Um, The best defence is a good neighbour. And until we see... Um, a willingness on the part of Zionists to share the land and respect the rights of the Palestinians, the threat of terrorism, a threat of attacks, uh, you know, individual attacks on synagogues or um, bus stations and so on, regrettably will not stop, um, as we hope, hope it will. But they've got to do with the causes and not just um, ratchet up the level of security. Because we know what the Israelis are going to do. They're just going to add more security guards to more synagogues. But that won't resolve the conflict. It won't resolve the tensions. Of course not. But then you mentioned that the um, Zionists tend to use the biblical scriptures. What does the Bible actually say about the promised land and about the, um, the like extent of land that the Jews actually should have? That's well, even if it says that. Well, the problem is that the promises God made to Abraham uh, 
define the, the geographical boundaries of the land God was giving to the descendants of Abraham. Uh, and I, I've said that those promises were understood as having been fulfilled. But over history, God has shown that um, the desire of God's people to have a king, for example, King Saul, was not part of God's plan, but they wanted a king because they wanted to be like the other nations. They were not willing to recognize God was their king. So he gave them a king, Saul, and uh, it got bad. You know, and then they had David, and he wasn't perfect. Then they had Solomon, and Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, and then the kingdom was divided. So you know, the aspiration to have what other nations have is not, uh, not a solution. Our hope is in, uh, and, and our, our security is in God himself, and to that extent, we shouldn't be caught up with looking for security in nationalism or political identity. I'm British, I'm happy to be British, but if I was living anywhere else in the world, I'd be happy to be whatever country I was born in or living in and to respect the laws and, and seek to be a good citizen. Um, so I don't, I don't believe as, as people of faith, we should put our security in citizenship and in borders and so on. Um, I mean, I, I know that within, within Islamic tradition, we have the concept of the, uh, the caliphate, the, 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 you know, the state under God. Um, within Christian, understand, uh, Christian terms, uh, in history, there has been the aspiration to create a Christian state. The problem is it's made up of fallen, fallible sinners. And whenever, uh, whenever uh, certainly within the Christian tradition, they've tried to impose biblical laws on people, it hasn't worked. It's, it's always been less than the ideal, whether it's the Crusades, whether it's Oliver Cromwell, uh, whether it's the divine right of kings. Um, so I've always seen uh, that our responsibility as people of faith is to live out our faith individually and collectively and seek to uh, agree laws um, and, and norms of behavior in a society that reflects the aspirations and hopes of all its peoples and not just one particular faith. So what matters is that, we, that the laws we pass are not telling us what we should eat, not telling us you know, what we should wear, not telling us uh, you know, how we should worship, but they deal with very basic things like, um, you know, deviant behaviour and um, what makes for, for peace and security in a community. So basically you're saying that um, the Christian faith also has have this idea of, of having a Christian leader like what ISIS has kind of implemented today. And of course, it's not really what we go by because we all believe that there's going to be a time where you know our um, awaited saviour is going to be coming, but it's not something that we humans are meant to be doing and, and, and enforcing on nations because that's not how it's meant to be. No, no, that, that's right. What the Christian scriptures teach is that government is ordained by God, mm -hmm. government is accountable to God, and government should exist to protect uh, citizens and uphold the rule of law and should punish lawbreakers. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm in favour of a minimalist set of laws and not one that we end up with something like George Orwell's 1984 where the government is big brother spying on us in our homes, you know, dictating what we can and can't eat, what we can and can't wear, where we can and can't go. You know, we're responsible under God for our behaviour, for the way we bring our families up, the way we, um, you know, the choices we make about our education and so on. I would not want to live under a kind of a communist rule where the government rules down to, you know, very fine detail of our lives. Um, so in those basic terms, uh, there is a very important role for government. Um, there are three authorities in, in Christian terms. There is uh, the, the state, the church, and the family. And it's very clear that we understand the difference between that 
parents have a responsibility for their children, uh, that the church or the synagogue or the mosque has a responsibility for our spiritual development, and the state has a responsibility to provide those, uh, those um, services that we need uh, to, you know, t to cooperate together. Think basic things like electricity, water, postal services, transportation, uh, you know, police, army and so on. I agree on, sorry to interrupt, I mm. agree on the three um, principles you're speaking about, but then for a government like, um, yes, you know, we, the majority tend to follow the, the, the laws and, 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 you know, respect what the government has in place on us, you know, for example, if we're, you know, we don't just, you know, cross the red light when we're driving because, mm. you know, we have to respect it. Yes. And there's a lot of consequence if we were to do such a thing. But then when we have a government, for example, that supports war and goes out to yes. war, that whole, you know, um, godly connection or yes. the whole idea of law then it breaks, it yes. crumbles and it makes us as, you know, um, let's say a, a religious people, if it was the church, the mosque, mm. the synagogue, or even like the atheists who don't actually believe in a God. Mm. But also it kind of breaks the family in a way that mm. we're not really understanding the whole aspect of peace mm. which is a great problem for all people regardless mm. if you're religious or not so isn't that a bit of a problem though to yes kind it of is and that's why we ha must take the initiative and take responsibility to change the government to use the vote that we have to ensure that we have politicians that do represent us and um and do respect the convictions that citizens have as to the way that they want to be led so, I mean, that is one of the privileges we have in a democracy, that every four years we can change the government. Um, so, I, so the role of the church, I, I can't speak for the synagogue or the mosque, but I see the role of the church in my own tradition, faith tradition, is to be Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Whoever is in government, we're there to hold them accountable to the promises they make, to the laws we pass, uh, to live by them themselves, you know, things like um, their expenses. You know, many politicians have been criticized for, uh, for uh, you know, exploiting their positions mm -hmm. uh, in, in immoral ways. So consistency is very important if we want to be respected and we want to be, um, le you know, we want to be leaders, we must lead in a wise and, and um, an honest way. But we can and must influence our government and our politicians if we feel that they are not leading us in a way that God would uh, expect. That's true, but then there are certain um, situations where the majority of the British nation would actually go out and protest, for example, against you know, um, the, the um, increase in university fees, for example, the war that they wanted to do in Syria um, mm. a few you know, months back. They, they did listen because they were kind of like um, forced to in a way, but they still in a way found another route to actually, mm. you know, go out to war and, and, and to, you know, protect Britain from, from the terror. Mm. But the thing is, it's like, they, the, if we were to vote for a party mm. that does represent us as individuals, isn't the government itself already have an agenda that whatever party is going to actually be in power, they're just going to be following regardless? Yes, I think it's, it's important that we um, are not naive when it comes to government, but I still think we could achieve so much more if more citizens played a proactive role in, um, in expressing their opinion to influence politicians. I mean, the reality is, again, I can't speak for the Muslim community in Britain, but more people attend church on Sunday than are members of the Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat parties combined. So the people who are influential in our political parties are a small minority of the wider society, but they have power, they have influence, and they have access to wealth in order to, um, to exploit the positions they have for their own benefit. So it's important that more citizens in our mosques, in our churches, in our synagogues, uh, play a role, a proactive role, in shaping our society in the way that we, we have, you know, we believe ne it needs to be. But it comes back to the relationship between heaven and earth, between, if you like, God's will and, and, 
the, the world in which we live. Um, our hope is in God and in his perfect will that we believe will come on earth as it is in heaven one day, inshallah. inshallah. And we work for that, uh, but we, and, and therefore I don't place my hope in a new government, that the next government will somehow, w w will build heaven on earth. But we, we, can, we can play a role in voting and in protesting and in lobbying for an improvement in, uh, in, in the way our society operates. I hope we actually, like, I doubt it would be in the next um, government, but we hope that there would be a slight change, if not, you know, for the foreign, yeah, and if not for the foreign political, you know, situations, but at least mm. in Britain itself, because there are mm. many things actually changed, which, you know, the British people themselves are actually mm. suffering from. Yes. When we to look back at um, your chapter, you mentioned that the kings there, um, if the king was actually universal, universal and nationalistic, um, was that the situation when they brought the king into power? Um, well, the, if we're thinking of the very short period of time from the time of Saul through David to Solomon, it's about 70 years. So in, in where are we, 3,000 years, 70 years is a relatively short period of time to have had sovereignty over much of the Middle East. Um, we know that Saul was a bad king. We know that David was a relatively good king, uh, but he went astray. And we know that Solomon had wisdom in dealing with government and in dealing with uh, people's questions, but we know he had many wives and he went after foreign gods. And, uh, and you know, he, so he wasn't that wise. Um, so what that teaches us is that even in the time when uh, God's people had a king, uh, they were still fallible. And yes, they enjoyed times of God's blessing, uh, but uh, the, you know, their hope was, ro was wrongly placed in having a king like the other nations, rather than acknowledging God as their, as their king. So was the, um, was, so when they had the king, they kind of like when they, lost that spiritual sense in a way of God instead they were thinking of worldly, worldly pr uh, pleasures. I think some of them were. It, it's also true that it was under David and Solomon that the temple was built in Jerusalem and and so again the, the, the uh, scriptures teach that God had never intended there to be a temple, that he was content to dwell with people um, in the sense of being with them, and that was what mattered, not um, having a, a fine temple made with gold and a permanent residence, if you like, alongside the palace of the king and so on. Uh, but clearly, um, what we see in the temple again is paralleled in pagan temples and pagan shrines, this desire to have a building that... Um, that they could show off because their god was bigger than the, 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 the foreign gods and so on. Um, but what mattered then as much now as now is the simple faith, a daily walk, a daily faith, prayer, worship, uh, and, and the desire to, to live out our faith in the way that we treat other people. That's our true worship. That's, uh, you know, God, god is more concerned about my heart than with me trying to build a fine building in his name or anything like that. Of course, but then when we to go back to the promised land, um, did the Christian Zionists mainly support Israel for what it's doing today in Palestine because they're believed to be the um, God's chosen people at the same time that, you know, because they used the promise that God made to Abraham. Yes. And, and is that why they're actually supporting yes. the Zionists? Yes, it, it, it's like um, a set of steps or a foundation. They believe that the Jews are God's chosen people, that the promises God made to Abraham were to the Jewish people by racial descent from Abraham. And therefore, the Jews today in Israel are the physical descendants of 
the Jews of the time of, uh, of, of the first century and going back to the, the Hebrew prophets, they believe there's that, that continuity. And on the basis of that, they believe the promises God made to Abraham are being fulfilled through the Jews today. It's like a fairy story. You know, it's, it, it's almost incredulous to believe that a, a, a people today, 3,000 years later or, or 4,000 years later, are literally the physical descendants of Abraham through Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. Some claim to be, and I'm not questioning that claim uh, anymore, if you claim to be descended from Muhammad, I wouldn't question that. Um, uh, but to believe that on the basis of those claims you have an exclusive claim to the land and an exclusive claim to Jerusalem and that uh, the Palestinians have no right whatsoever. That's racism, it's apartheid, it's discrimination, and it's the opposite of what God said in the Hebrew Scriptures about how God's people should live in God's land. What did, the, um, what did God say in the Jewish Scriptures? About? About the land itself. Cause, um, he said that the land is mine, and you are the aliens and the tenants, uh, and therefore... Uh, you know, God's people's presence in the land was not, this is mine, it belongs to God, and therefore I've got to be a good steward of what belongs to him. And that was the idea behind the year of Jubilee. Every seven years, um, they had to leave the land fallow. They had to uh, just let the land rest for a year, uh, like the weekly cycle of a Sabbath rest. And every 49 years, they had to release the debts of anyone who owed money. They had to release the slaves. They had to give back the land to the people who had lived on it originally because the land was God's and not theirs permanently. They weren't allowed to keep building more and more houses for themselves. Uh, they were to share the produce of the land. So they were meant to be the tenants. And if you are renting a property, you know it's not yours it belongs to someone else and therefore you look after it. I'm, I'm, I've borrowed a car because my car is broken. It's not mine and therefore I've got to look after it because it belongs to someone else. If you have that mentality uh, to the land, then you realize that we're only here temporarily. You mentioned that, um, you know, we, that the Jewish people believe that the, the land is all for God and everything. So we've got the Zionists using the um, Christian scripture which is, of course, um, from what you've explained, not really um, valid today because, you know, the promise between God and Abraham has already been fulfilled. They're using that to get what they want and forgetting their own religious scriptures. Mm. They're being partial in which scriptures they listen to. The Orthodox Jews today love the law of Moses, but they don't regard the message of the prophets in the same way. It's like a child wanting to eat the sweets and not the meat. They want the, they want the goodies without taking the, the vegetables and the, and the meat, which they need to be healthy. They want the promises without the conditions. And that's the problem. You can't do that with the scriptures. So they're just basically picking and choosing what they yes. want from each scripture. Yes. Yes. But then do, isn't, because there is a group of Jews that we um, see a lot while, while protesting around London and, and other the areas. Chiricata. Yeah, they, they believe that they're not really meant to have a state. Mm. Um, yes, I mean, that, that in a sense is Orthodox Judaism that, that has always opposed Zionism. You see, Zionism is not consistent with Orthodoxy, with, with the plain teaching of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. It's, it's like, um, you know, a cuckoo? A cuckoo is a bird that uh, lives in other, other birds' nests. It takes over. It pushes the other ones out and it takes over. Well, that's what they've done. They've taken over the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and they've made Judaism and Zionism synonymous, and they're not. The Orthodox Jews of groups like Natura Carta are Orthodox. They are committed to Judaism, but they repudiate Zionism as, uh, as a heresy within Judaism, as much as Christian Zionism is a heresy within Christianity. Thank you very much for um, joining us on the show.
And thank you very much for watching Beneath the Surface. See you next time.